sometimes you're wrong, but at the time when you have to make the decision, you're never in doubt. They have to know that you know what to do and you're doing the right thing. In fact, war never leaves your mind, right? It never, ever leaves me. Every time I go someplace, it reminds me of, I was at this other place. I just survived an RPG, which I could have died in. I'm just curious, how do you track nurses' movements? We just basically have a badge and they wear a badge and we heat map how they move. And I want to know what the pain points are at the very granular level. We're trying to set them a uh -huh. solution at the point of care and give them an enterprise that meets the top level executives need to know. I have a second chance. I just survived a war. How am I going to make the days of my life count? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Health Tech Beat podcast. Uh, the mission of our podcast is to show the real life challenges of implementing and working with technology in healthcare. Uh, the podcast is sponsored by Demigas, a company that develops custom IT solutions for healthcare startups and companies. You can check more on uh, demigas.com. My name is Ivan Dunsky, and I'm joined today by a special guest, Raj Mbay. Uh, Dr. Raj um, is a surgeon, a colonel in the U.S. Army, and entrepreneur. While in Afghanistan, he was injured by a rocket-propelled grenade. The, the surgeon now became the patient and saw both sides of the equation, which led to the founding of Nine Line Medica Company. The goal of the company is to leverage emerging technology to improve the operational efficiency of healthcare. And the slogan is, we are the handshake between IT and the clinical services group. Raj, uh, thank you for joining. How are you today? I'm doing great, Ivan. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Um, I want to start with your astonishing experience in the U.S. Army. Uh, you were a trauma surgeon uh, for 26 years in the Army and participated in multiple wars. Uh, you supported special forces in combat. Could you please share the key insights you gained from this experience? Yeah, so one of the things that I, I, I um, really enjoyed about special operations is the ingenuity of groups like that. Um, you don't always have everything at hand, but you have a few things that you have to fashion to make things work. Um, and I think that requires a lot more cognitive um, work through in your mind to get things done. You have to look for solutions. Uh, they're not always right in front of you. Um, and I think that in the battlefield in general, that is the case uh, because it is not like a civilian hospital. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what skills did you acquire during military service that you applied in your civilian medical practice? So I think one of the key skills really is that um, so many innovations really come from uh, wars, unfortunately, right? Yeah. Everything from penicillin uh, in the early world wars uh, to the advancement of technology um, and the way we think about things in trauma. So uh, one of the things that I had learned is, one, not just the resourcefulness, but you really had to be everywhere. Um, in the civilian sector, you know, we tend to be very um, specialized and super specialized focused. So, you know, if you were a surgeon who does one type of surgery, uh, if you now had to do a little bit of orthopedics or a little bit of neurosurgery or a little mm -hmm. bit of urology, you know, you would refer the patient. Uh, which I understand the reason to do that, but all, but in the battlefield, you know, you don't have a full cadre of people uh, in multiple specialties helping you out. So you had to know enough about everything uh, to keep the patient out of danger. Um, and in the civilian side, that really helped make me, I think, an even more confident surgeon. Uh, you know, gain confidence by practice in the civilian side, uh, but on the civilian side. If you have a problem, you can call another specialist in. Um, if the patient has an issue breathing, well, you know, the anesthesiologist is right there to make things uh, happen for you. If you need another instrument, somebody will go running out into the corridor and go find it and get it for you when you need it. So you have everything at your disposal, but on the military side, you don't. So the resourcefulness um, 
and the confidence that you get from the fact that even if my anesthesiologist passes out, I can probably keep this patient alive. I think there's a lot of confidence in that. I assume there were a situation where you were kind of confused what to do because um, the time is very critical and the um, consequence of mistake is huge. So could you remember some maybe examples and how you overcame it? Like what solution did you find? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you that I never really, I, I never really think that I make the wrong decision. Um, oh. It's only when you look in retrospect, you realize that you could have done something more. Uh -huh. So there's a saying that uh, I've actually told other younger surgeons. I've also told, told this even to my own daughter. I said, you know, um, as a surgeon, you have to have legs of steel. You're standing a long time for many, many hours without sleep. A heart of gold. You have to do things for the right reason. Sometimes you're wrong. But at the time when you have to make the decision, you're never in doubt. Because if you cast doubt on your decisions while the team is standing around a patient who's got both their legs blown off, they have to know that you know what to do and you're doing the right thing. Now, in retrospect, there are things that you do and you say, I wish I'd have done that differently because you do, look, you do lose people. Yeah. So you shouldn't be overly confident, uh, but you can lose people. Um, and so, uh, I had an instance, um, I had an instance in, uh, Afghanistan, uh, where, um, we had a patient and what, you know, and, and both their legs were blown off and they had tourniquets on their legs. Um, and, and when you see something like that, and it just looks like, you know, a bunch of cloth being torn on that, but it's actually skin and bones. And this patient looked like I wasn't sure that they were going to make it. Well, there was so much blood and gore that I'm focused on the legs. But the problem was that there was this tiny little pea-sized piece of metal, shrapnel, that mm -hmm. went into the center of their neck, right? Just in the little notch in the collarbone here, right? And it hit an artery. And the problem is, the person was not going to die from the legs being blown off. They were going yeah. to die because they were drowning in their own blood. The blood was filling into their lungs. And, um, and so, and at the last minute, as the anesthesiologist kept saying, we're losing the patient. I can't, I can't, I can't push any more air. I'm having lots of problems. Um, and I'm wondering to myself, well, they've got tourniquets on their legs. We've stopped the bleeding. What's the issue, right? Well, the thing is, in a, in a regular trauma sequence, you kind of look from head to, tail, head to toe. And, and we do that actually even in the military side. But, but, there was, but in the craziness of 20 people being injured, because when there's a blast, it's not just one person that gets injured. Yeah. It's usually everybody in the vehicle or the vehicle in front and the vehicle behind them. I get injured and there's only one of me and three people helping me and i've got minutes to make a decision as, as to yes. who i'm taking to the operating room how much how much supplies do i have uh and who do i have a reasonable chance at saving um so those are hard decisions and there's no right or wrong um but the problem but but the the thing is when you make that decision you have to be able to live with it you have to make it with all the information that you have. So in this particular case, at the last minute, while they were while we were losing this person, um, they coughed and blood splattered out of that little tiny hole, and that's how we found it. I mean, the mm -hmm. hole was about the size of a little BB, and it's that little BB that would have killed the patient not the fact that there was blood everywhere and both the legs were blown off. So it changed my practice because I realized that you have to pay attention to the things that are going to get this patient first that are going to kill them. 
you have to think quickly on your feet um, and not just get distracted by the thing that is so obviously in front of you that you think will kill the patient. So every time I approach the patient in the operating room, and, and I've had an, a couple of instances, even on the civilian side, where I have, paid, I have asked questions of the anesthesiologist and the staff, and I've done an exam on the operating room table when things are not going well. And sometimes I just stop for a second, because sometimes it's not the fact that you're running as fast as you can that helps you think. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that you stop for 10 seconds and look and think and say, OK, what's happening here? This is how I'm going to solve it. So those are some of the lessons that I've learned and an example that I've had. Yeah, great. I think that um, that experience also helps you in, in the general decision making process. Um, so could you share how you overcome situations when you actually lost a patient? So what is, what is your attitude? Because I understand it hurts. But like, what what is that you're saying to yourself and how you move on with that? Uh, uh, that that's, it's always difficult. It's never easy. Yeah. And you're always thinking about it. And I can tell you that years gone by, I still remember all my failures. Um, you still remember the look in someone's eyes before they die. It never leaves your mind. In fact, war never leaves your mind. Right? It never, ever leaves me. Um, it rem every time I go someplace, it reminds me of, I was at this other place. I see a movie and I thought, oh my God, this is just like what I saw. Um, I don't go out and, and, and watch fireworks anymore in the 4th of July celebrations here in the United sure. States, right? I'm not comfortable sure. with all of that. Sure. Um, but those are natural consequences. I think the key is that one, you have to have people behind you who love you um, because then you have a safe, <coughs> excuse me, you have a safe space to vent. You need a safe mm -hmm. space, right? So all these soldiers who go through wars, some of them come home to broken families. Others come home to nobody. So having somebody to come home to is really important part of healing. Having someone to talk to, because keeping that inside is not helpful. Because what happens is you just mull it. You go over and over in your mind. Mm -hmm. Did I do this? Did I do yeah. that? Should I have done this? Right? There's guilt. But you didn't create that. All you can do is you can do your best. So over the years, I've come to the point where I realize that I have to do my best in every single thing I do. And if it doesn't work out that way, then I am not going to let that affect the fact that I'm going to do my best for the next person that comes through. So you're always looking back, but it really starts with having, having um, comfort around you, right? Whether that even, you know, there's a lot of veterans here in the United States that don't have a lot of family. Well, well they have a veteran family. So there has to mm -hmm. be veteran organizations, other soldiers who, who comfort one another, who take one another into their families, who help one another. Yeah, and I think it's, it's something that simple because they understand things that other people would never have understood. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of um, kind of tough for me as well because I observe things in Ukraine, and yeah, it's I understand. Yeah, the, su the support of those soldiers are so critical, right? Uh, I mean, because they are not who they were before they left for a war, any war. It doesn't matter what period of time. It doesn't matter what war. It doesn't matter what country you've come from. When you see what you've seen, you can't unsee it. Um, so it's kind of the little things sometimes, you know. Um, in the United States, the things that I really admire is there's a respect for the military, um, and people will say, thank you for your service. And my daughter will write an essay and, and talk about some of the things that the lessons that I've learned that I have taught her. Um, there's a lot to teach, 
but I think it really starts with the society as a whole understanding that the people that went to war and came back are not who they are. You have to give them mm. some patience, some time, some understanding, and you have to, you really do have to give them a hug when they need it. It's, it's, it can be that simple, really. And I don't mean to be mushy or soft on it, uh, but I have seen this for 25 years. I have seen, I have seen young boys come go with weapons and they were the strongest kid in school and they were afraid of nothing. And yeah. the first time someone fired back at them and the first time they were either injured or saw their friend be killed in front of them, they are never the same person again. Yeah. I sympathize a lot with, with what, what is, what is occurring in, in Ukraine. And I, and I do hope and pray that there is peace for the people because in the end of the day, the, it's the people that bear the brunt of war in any war at any time. It's the average yeah. person, the farmer, the mechanic, right? The, 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 it's, those are the people that bear the brunt of war. Yeah. Yeah, let's uh, move on and talk about your company. So in 2015, you, you founded Nine Line Medical. And could you tell us um, about um, how an idea came to you and what is the company's strategy and for their upcoming years and what is your primary focus? Yeah, uh, I... I... You know, after I was in Afghanistan, I got hit by a rocket propelled grenade and I spent a lot of time in the hospitals. Um, and all that time I spent in the hospitals, I was, a, I was a surgeon in some of these hospitals and now I'm mm -hmm. the patient. And that mm -hmm. gives you a completely different perspective on, on what's important. Uh, you start seeing, well, why did I have to wait for this? How come this took so long? Why couldn't they see me right away? Um, yeah. All of these things started, and, so I, 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 and it was that moment and those inefficiencies that I saw that gave me my moment to pause. I got to do something, right? So mm -hmm. I just, I just survived an RPG which I could have died in, and so I came back. I had a second opportunity. What am I going to do with that opportunity? I'm going to do something that is going to change, hopefully, the way healthcare is delivered. So I focus really on emerging technology, uh, AI, ML, blockchain, and my goal really is to improve the operational efficiency of healthcare, and the ultimate goal is to deliver a seamless and smooth healthcare to people, because at the end of the day, the only KPI in healthcare is, did the person I'm treating get better? Did they have yes. a great experience? It is not, it, it is so unlike technology in the finance sector or technology in other sectors where the KPI is very different. And, and the KPI in those sectors can be um, a lot more quantifiable than the KPI in healthcare, which is, I subjectively feel so much better after you gave me that med or you did that surgery. Or you said nice things to me when I was really down and in that hospital room that made me feel better, that gave me strength. Yeah. How do you quantify that? You can't quantify it. And can you elaborate a little bit more on what spe specific projects you are building? Yeah, so we, um, you know, there was a handful of issues that I saw that were really uh, issues that I thought were worldwide in healthcare. Um, patient wait times was one of them, right? So getting an appointment is always difficult. You call, oh, when can you see me? Oh, we have an appointment in five weeks. You're like, well, I'm in pain today, right? Five weeks doesn't really work. And then you show up in the office and the office opened at nine o'clock and you show up at nine o'clock and they're running one hour behind and you're wondering why, right? And, mm -hmm. and this, wait, this wait time is such a significant problem, both to make an appointment and to once you're there, wait and wait and wait for to be seen by the doctor. So one of the projects we're working on is uh, actually it's not even a project. It is a platform that we have actually already built that's implemented um, into a number of practices. Um, 
and it's a platform called Gravity, and we work with Alpha Notice, which is the commercial arm of our company. Um, <clears throat> and um, and that and one of the goals there is to allow people to get into there and get into the uh, and know how long it's going to take them to go see the doctor. Um, what it also does is we have a lot of machine learning to reduce the administrative burden, right? Because doctors and nurses are there to take care of patients. And if you ask them to do 10 pieces of paper and five logons to do it, it adds so much more time to the day that they can see only, they see fewer patients because of that. And the, and the problem is, is that when you have the first two things, administrative burden and patient wait times, then you get staff burnout. Because mm -hmm. the front desk is always being yelled at by the patient. The doctor told me to come at nine o'clock. It's 10 o'clock. Why am I seen? When am I going to see? How come this is not done? Why do I have to pay this? Right? I thought I didn't have to pay anything. So frustrations, changing demands, more paperwork. Um, this is causing staff burnout. So now people who had more job satisfaction from the employee level start having problems. And then we have issues in supply chain management. And then we have a system of broken communication. So we're doing a number of different things. We're, we're leveraging uh, ML and RPA, the robotic process automation, to automate tasks that we know follow rules that are just very simple. Uh, we created an AI dynamic scheduling system. Um, mm -hmm. And that scheduling system actually changes every five seconds. So as we're able to move the mundane task through the system quicker, it means that we can get out, reach out to patients quicker and get them booked in quicker. Um, and you can't just hire staff to keep making a bunch of phone calls to people. So while we created this automated system um, that intelligently looks at the system and figures out if you need X procedure and it takes 15 minutes and somebody needs X procedure and it takes 30 minutes, it will it'll predict that time knowing that you're gonna see Dr. Uh, Smith and Dr. Smith does it in 30 minutes, whereas Dr. Jones does it in 15 minutes, right? It'll mm -hmm. take all those into account. So now you're scheduling intelligently. It's not like you're just scheduling blocks for people, uh, which is really how most of the EMRs work today is block scheduling. It looks at the kind of previous performance of a specific doctor and predicts, um, okay. Correct. Well, not only that, one step further is that we actually watch how the nurses move. Uh, we watch which rooms are available. So now what happens is we know which teams work with the doctor, which teams work more efficiently, how long do things take. And when one nurse calls out, we know what the effect on the system is going to be. And so if we have to send a text out to a patient and said, hey, we know your appointments at 3.30, or we know your appointments at 3.30, however we're running, 30 minutes behind come at 4 p.m. They appreciate that. Because in that 30 minutes, they could have been at work. They could have gone to the grocery store. They could have picked up their kid from school and taken them home, right? Instead of leaving all of these things undone. I'm just curious, how do you track nurses' movements? Is it uh, cameras or? No, no. So we, what we do is we just basically have a badge and they wear a badge and we heat map how they move. Uh-huh, okay. Right? And and then the system, once it starts seeing how they move, it starts predicting, well, if they did this, it would be better. Or if you scheduled, if you're doing a, wow. a, a, a ultrasound, which is a portable machine, you should actually have it in room one, which is closest to the front, versus room seven, and then room five, and then room three, and then room two. Or then you don't even know, you're not scheduling the resource with the patient who needs it at that time. You're having two people scheduled at the same time who need the same ultrasound machine. And it's a $200,000 machine that you can't buy three of. So it takes all of that into account. So here's, a, here's a, an example that didn't use technology, but got to the same point. McDonald's. McDonald's did not invent the hamburger. They did not invent the shakes or the, fr the shake or fries. They invented a process, fast yeah. food. And they knew that if you put the ketchup near the mustard, near the onions, right, and then you had the grill going near the buns, then you could run this e e efficient chain, and that became fast food. And they timed each part of the procedure, and they figured out what, what element needed to be next to another element to maximize efficiency. 
right? So in the healthcare sector, what equipment do I need in each room? How much gauze do I need? How much Q-tips? How much lidocaine and anesthesia? <clears throat> Who do I need in that room? Where should the equipment be? It's not just about the patient showing up. It's about having them show up, having them in the room, and then being able to have everybody available to deliver the care and all the resources in the room that's necessary for that care. And in time. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that's just some of the, you know, we've got blockchain, we're doing blockchain. Um, so for communication, right? I mean, that's the beauty. Mm. I mean, it is in a very simple level. The problem is, is that I, I tell one doctor one thing, uh, then I tell my nurse uh, to go order a supply. Then she does an email or a phone call to the vendor. Then the vendor says, well, it won't be here next week, but it'll be next other thing. And all of those, none of which are recorded on a ledger. So mm -hmm. nobody really knows what the process happened. Where, where are we? And then the nurse goes on, on, on um, or the scheduling person or the uh, sterile processing people, somebody goes on vacation, it doesn't get the email and it falls through. So now what ends up happening is what doesn't even go on a financial ledger still gets put into a block immutably as it passes through the system so that I told my nurse to do this. She called the uh, people to call the vendor. The vendor said that it's available. The product is going to be shipped and delivered on this date. The surgery is on this date. And so the instruments will be ready for that surgery on that date. And everything comes together at that time for that surgery. And if anything goes wrong, you know where in the, in the chain things broke down. So you can then look at root cause analysis and solve those issues. Yeah, the, the value that the, this system could bring to a facility is obvious, but we all know how conservative decision makers in these facilities could be um, taken into consideration that the system covers like different aspects of uh, the oper operational activities. So could you share how, how do you sell the system to facilities and like how you convince them um, and speed up the sales process? The first part is to try and listen to what their biggest issues are. Um, mm -hmm. So I listen to what their issues are. I want to know what the pain points are. And I want to know what the pain points are at the very granular level. Because the problem is we're trying to we're not trying to sell them an umbrella system that covers the whole enterprise. We're trying to sell them a uh -huh. solution <clears throat> at the point of care and give them an enterprise that meets the top level executives need to know. And, and then we are going to combine those two so that people at the bottom act as champions for this for the solution. Yeah. Um, so you, if people at the bottom say, my God, ever since I had this, I have, I love not having to log in to five systems. Oh, I didn't even, you know, one of the biggest compliments I got for, for Gravity Healthcare um, was that I asked when I went for an, uh, I went for an MRI and I asked the tech, oh, you know, we, we do the um, artificial intelligence here and the scheduling for the MRIs. How's it going? And she said to me, oh, I didn't really realize you guys are doing that. Oh, it's going great. You know, they made some changes and then the system works really, really well right now. I don't, I didn't even know why. That's great because I just reduced the provider burden. She didn't have to think twice about things. So you have to speak to their pain points. And, and again, you have to know your audience, right? So you want to, you, you want to build champions from the bottom by solving real problems. And then you want to give people access at the top. Um, so that they can um, they can get the data they need. And it's not just the data, right? Because in the beginning, it was all about big data. Then big data got so overwhelming that no one knew what to do with it, right? So now we need to parse the big data out. And, and now people say, well, if there's, if there's a solution, when, this, when, when A and B come together, why can't C just happen on its own? And if it doesn't, just let me know, right? So that's where the automation part comes in. So you have to understand your customer's needs, both at the top and the bottom, 
to build both champions and, and funders at the top who have the ability to turn the lever to make that happen. Because if their employees tell them, we really need this, this is really going to, I mean, so you make the business case financially to the people at the top and you make the workflow case to people at the bottom. And then mm -hmm. you understand what they want. Like, for instance, when we told people we were going to monitor how they walk around, they're like, are you going to see me in the bathroom? I mean, are you going to know how many times I go? By? I mean, it's just things like that, right? So you're going to follow me in the bathroom? Like, no, 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 we're not going to do this. But, but what we did tell them is, <clears throat> we, you work so hard. And we want your boss to see how hard you work. And we're going to democratize the data. Mm -hmm. And by democratizing the data, we're going to show you what your value is to the organization. When you show go to impression. your boss mm -hmm. and you ask for a raise because you, somebody else gave you an offer, but you really want to stay at this company that you're at, you have the data in your hands to say, here's my value to the company. And the boss can look at that and decide whether that value meets a higher salary line. And we had such an example just like that. We had an uh, employee who was an MRI technician and she was making, you know, she was making just to say $25 an hour. And somebody came up to her and said, another company will give you $28 an hour, $3 an hour more. And, and she was already at the top because she'd been there for 15 years. She was already at the top of her salary line. So the boss has said, no, 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 no. You're already at the top of the salary line. We, you can't get that, right? What's the justification for that? Well, no one has a justification. All right. So there is no real justification because this person is not a provider. They don't drive revenue, but mm -hmm. they actually do drive value in the organization. So we measured what that value was. And we realized that this person sees so many patients and, and rooms, so many people that her value to the organization is $55 an hour. So would you lose 20? And the next person below her was something like $29 an hour. So this person had $30 an hour of additional val value to the practice. Why wouldn't you pay her 28? Yeah. And retain Excuse her? me. So did I get it right that you connected the performance with the economical impact, right? Yes. And that's how you measured Correct. And we democratized versus... the data. Yeah. And we showed wow, the people cool. the data because if people get to see their own data, they don't feel like management is doing something behind their back. Um, did you face with situations uh, where decision makers or operational level push back because or they don't want that level of transparency? We let that level of transparency be the decision of management because every employer is going to be a little bit different. So that level of transparency was one example. Um, they've posted boards. I've had people post boards of their top performers where they gave them bonuses in front of everybody, right? They recognized them, their hard work. And sometimes that's what people want. It's not always about yeah. the money part. Sometimes I'd yeah. rather take a dollar less and have happiness in my job than $2 more and hate waking up every morning. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so you are currently concentrating on government projects. Uh, could you elaborate on your approach and how you can compete with larger corporations when bidding for government contracts? So if we look back at our logo or our, our, our little catchphrase, we're the handshake between where healthcare meets technology. So we stay in that space, right? Because the one thing we understand is the ground up, how to build that technology. The larger companies are not looking at ground up. They come into these enterprise level and say, we have this box solution for you. Uh -huh. And the box solution will do everything until you yeah. actually... And the problem with healthcare is that there's so much diversity. There's about 90% of the workflow is the same everywhere you go. And then there's 10% that needs to be highly customizable for that particular place. Mm -hmm. And even within specialties in the same enterprise, you have to have a different workflow.
this is where the AI and ML and, and things like that come in because it can learn the workflow of 200 different provider groups. It can staff it appropriately, learn the workflow, and then feed into the larger system that data so now they're actually seeing real things happen. Uh, and, and so we're not really directly competing with large businesses because we're not doing at the enterprise level uh, their cybersecurity and, and you know, mm -hmm. we're really saying to them, let us help you build champions at the granular level so that the people who do the work, the, the people who benefit from the work, and the people who provide that work all say this is the best thing since sliced bread. They speak mm -hmm. your accolades because you don't have to. And um, how do you learn about the most pressing challenges that this or that um, organization has? Because like, even if there is a tender process, of course, they may submit some kind of RFP or some other descriptions of the project they need, but it may not cover like the real, real challenges. So how do you discover the most uh, pressing things that you can curate solution to them? So I think it, it really begins by having a very, having a team that has a level of uh, knowledge at the very granular level. Because when sometimes when these RFPs come out, um, they say, we wanna build this whole suite of tools on a platform uh, we have a thousand different discrete databases and we want those databases to talk to one another and we yeah. want researchers to be able to come in and pull the data out and use it for all these great things and then build tools off of them. But the fundamental problem is you're not speaking the same language in these thousand databases, right? Mm -hmm. They're not interoperable. So, so the meta tags are not been, the, the meta tags have not been discernible elements that can be deconstructed and reconstructed depending on whatever the use is. So that's where we come in and we say, look, I know you want to do this, but you need to do this first, right? Mm -hmm. and, and by doing this, you can now do all the things you want to do. So that becomes our value add to even a large company who has this enterprise contract who's wondering why it doesn't work. But don't it happen that like they can say, Hey, we don't have time for this. Just give me a bit like yeah. all other companies do. So I think that our strategy has really been, been to, uh, to um, bid to what we, can, we know we can succeed in. Because the problem mm -hmm. is, is that at least in the government space, if you bid to something and you're given the project and you fail miserably, it is a black mark that is hard to erase. It's better to, to do nothing or to do less than to do too much and fail. So I think, mm -hmm. you know, the teams, you know, it, there's a, I, I noticed that it's sort of in many government companies, there is this rush to do everything. Um, I've seen it even in my own, uh, the, you know, IT company friends, uh, it, and they will do contracts with the defense industry, then they'll do healthcare, then they'll do border protection, AI, and then they'll do fi FinTech. And, and so who are you really? So I think the real thing is we really keep our focus really narrow. I say, okay, mm -hmm. these are the ones that we're gonna go after that has the greatest impact. This is where our, this is where the sweet spot of our, and, and it is a longer term approach, right? Because you're not grabbing as much money as you can from five different pots, but you're grabbing money from the same pot or the same three pots or four pots. Um, and you're doing good work and that work is being recognized and that good rec work that's recognized now builds trust in government, uh, in the government employees. Because remember the people that are making those decisions in government, they don't get paid more or less to go through your bid or somebody else's bid or a thousand bids. So they're looking for someone that can do the job, that has adequate past performance, has the, the personnel and the skill sets, um, and can do it at a reasonable price because at the end of the day, they don't want to lose their job because they made a dumb decision and now a billion dollars is in the toilet. Yeah, they're looking for security. Yes, yes.
So who is the person, right? What are we trying to achieve? Um, and not every, and honestly, there are things that we just, you know, there are things that we just pass on because it's just, even within the health sector, we look at them like, we don't have the time to do it. We don't have the resources to do it. We don't have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people will say, well, just give me the money first and I'll figure out how to get the people. Mm -hmm. Right. And what we know is this is what we can do. Let's let's really clamp down on what it is that we know we can do, be a success here, and then take a hub and spokes effect to building the business where this is our hub and all the spokes are things that we can do that are in parallel. And here's here's an example. When we gave the talk for this dynamic scheduling, pre-authorization, uh, and we did it at a major academic institution in the United States, an internationally recognized institution in the United States. The people that showed up was the Department of Radiology, because that's what the project was for. And the computer science people showed up, which we expected because there was AIML and this was a few years back. Sure. And so everybody was kind of excited about it. But then the other people that showed up was the real estate and construction. And I, when they introduced themselves, I thought to myself, what is construction and real estate doing here? This is a ra radiology platform that talks about scheduling, right? And automation. But what they liked about this is that we mapped out how people move. And in doing so, they could create a virtual practice and build their new clinic to meet the needs of the greatest efficiency for how that, how that care is delivered in that institution. Yeah, like more sophisticated planning. It's not just an architect who has all these years of years, oh yeah, I've always done it this way. The rooms need to be 10 by 12 yeah. and they need to be blah, blah, blah. And they, the corridors need to be here and you know. So now these guys are learning how do these doctors and nurses and other ancillary medical fields work? What are the requirements that they need? Right, it's again, think about McDonald's again. How do I make, you know, because if the fryer is too small and you have a hundred burgers you have to make, but it's only two burgers at a time, that's rate limiting. Even if you put everything in line, the fryer only makes two burgers and you have a hundred people in line. It's not fast food, no matter how you look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the fryer has got to be a big size as a reasonable size. And, and that's where the construction people come in. But that was an mm -hmm. aha moment for me. I thought, oh my God, you know what? That's amazing. Yeah. And then, and then not long after that, another large MRI manufacturer came up to you and said, you know, we want to give away our MRIs. I was like, what? Give away your, it's a $2 million piece of machinery. No, no, we want MRI as a service. Mm. And I was like, MRI is a service. So you're going to give them the equipment and every month for eternity, you're going to take a piece of every MRI that's done. That means if I schedule efficiently and bring 30 more percent of the patients in through the door to see in that MRI machine, that was then that was otherwise realized, right? Unrealized revenue. I make it, I realize that revenue. Now it makes that two million dollars seem really small because after that two million dollars is paid, no one buys another MRI I machine for the next decade. Mm -hmm. But in this model, yeah. MRI as a service with the software, they make money. So hub and spokes. Here's what we do. And all these little offshoots that come from that, that surprise us. Mm. Yeah, great. It seems that the system you built is quite complex. Could you um, tell the story how you started it? I mean, did you bootstrap it? Like what team did you have? So what, what were the, the early stages of the product development? So, you know, the benefit of being a medical practitioner and still being in practice was the fact that we actually started in my office. Uh -huh. So we built a little bit of it. And, uh, and what I did is I had all the IT guys. I said, why don't you guys come and spend a week in my office? Sit with the girl in the front who's taking the call, sit with the call center, sit with the person who's doing appointments, sit with the surgery scheduling people, sit with our patient coordinators and our nurses, and just watch. And they would they, they would they were amazed. They're like, 
well, how do you know? Well, if you have a, a, a blank in your schedule, how do you fill it? Oh, well, we have a whiteboard and we just write the patient's name on there. They're like, well, why didn't she automate that? And, and there were so many times they were looking at this like they were dumbfounded. Why? I, I don't understand. Why do you do it this way? That's so inefficient. So they understood. And then I, and I asked them to ask what the pain points are. So mm -hmm. what could I do for you that would make your job easier? How many calls do you take? What are the calls about? If you take 50, if you're expected to take 50 calls an hour, let's just say, and 30 of those calls are, how do I get to the facility? Then maybe you should create another automated system to give them directions or send them a text on how to get to the facility. And now you freed up 30 calls from that 50 call log. Now you're taking more calls for patients who actually want to book, who are new patients who want to come in. So we actually did it. Um, iteratively in the practice, I asked my staff, hey, does this work for you? Does that work for you? They were like, oh, I, it's okay, but I got to jump to three screens just to get to this stupid thing. I hate it. Oh, okay. Well, what if we made it one? Is that better for you? Oh, yeah. that would. I only really need to see this. I don't even understand why this dashboard has all this stuff on there. I don't even care about this mm -hmm. stuff. Right? It's just things like that, that you tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak until you're like, that's it. And did you fund it yourself? We did. We bootstrapped the whole thing. And it was not wow. easy. Uh, it was not, it, yeah. honestly, it was not easy because, but this was sort of a, this became the, hey, I have a second chance. I just, I just survived a war. Um, how am I going to make the days of my life count? How am I going to make every day that I am breathing count? Because I have the second chance and I know there were people that I treated that did not. By by count, do you mean that um, you kind of looking for um, the, the the biggest value you can bring to others, right? Yes, is what you mean by count. Correct. Every day I get up, I want to do something that makes a difference in the world, even if it is small. If each one of us did one thing each day, that the world would be a much better place if we thought consciously about doing one thing. It doesn't have to be you you come up with something that changes the world. And but uh, at and, least somebody somebody you know, somebody you can yes, bring value to. Right. So the my my part of my goal was, you know, I had gone through so much and they were going to amputate my right leg and this and that and I still have all these health problems and plates and screws in my neck and elbow and back and um, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff, you know, scars everywhere. Um, I get to lay down in bed every night and, and never regret that I did some really awesome things. I got to go to the office and do surgery. I see less patients, but I spend more time with them. So I develop a relationship with them. And I build IT systems that improve the way I can deliver care. I can do it at less money, deliver care. Everyone's happy. My staff is happier. I mean, I've had staff that don't leave, uh, and I'm so thankful for that. I've got providers that love what they do each day, and they even if I even if they were offered more in another job, they'll take this job because they get they get the time and the uh, and the autonomy to to contribute to the organization. Um, so I'm very happy. Um, now, you know, everyone has got to determine what's their happy, where is their happy place? What do they need? But the longer, the longer I've gone around, uh, the longer I live, uh, the more likely I have realized um, that it is, that you, you, it's really not just about buying new things. And I can tell you that after being injured, I never really spent time in the hospital thinking, I have to remodel my house. I have to fix my car. I would like a better car. <laughs> I spent my time thinking about my health, my family, my future, right? The things that matter. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I think it's a great perspective how you went through so traumatic events and how you, what is your perspective on what is valuable and how it taught you, like what, what kind of lessons it, it gave to you. Um, 
one yeah, of my I goals think... actually one of my goals actually and this is really why I do a lot of this work at um on the AI and ML and so on is and the government sector because um I love working with veterans um mm-hmm. because in a way I can go I I remember when I was a surgeon at um at one of the VA hospital which is a veteran hospital in the United States and when I go into a room and I see a veteran and and they tell and I ask them where were you and they say I was in this place and I say I was there too do you remember that statue in the middle of the square and they're like oh yes yes you know and immediately there's a connection there's a trust mm-hmm. right that to me is so gratifying i still get my care at the va and what's really cool about it is if i get contracts at the va to do work i get to fulfill two ambitions of one keeping busy and and making a difference in the world and two making a difference for people that i care about who i served with and and then that also helps the civilian side too because again like i said in the at the opening so many lessons of war translate to civilian world yeah yeah we are coming to the end of the interview and um i would like to ask um um question what what advice would you give to professionals who are looking f- to develop um, or implement technology in healthcare whether they are experienced uh, clinicians or they are IT guys who want to build something valuable for healthcare the beauty about healthcare today is that you have to work a- a- as a team um and that's the that's probably the best advice i can give to you because not one person can't do everything um you have to also learn to compromise a little bit because what happens is uh as people are building things people feel like i'm more important than you are and i should be doing this and but but really you should be working as a team there's an old saying i i think it's an african saying and i tried to look this up but i i didn't know for sure uh so i can't credit exactly who said this but there's a saying that's that that i really like and it goes like this if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go together and if you want to go far in building your business in IT put together the right team of people who have the same values and mindset um create an environment that um people can say whatever they want and throw it against the wall and see if it sticks because sometimes people come saying oh why can't we do this and everyone's like well that's a dumb idea and then all of a sudden the person doesn't say anything anymore but if they're like well why do you why would you say that you do this well how would you get around this problem right so the the issue is everyone wants to say no you can't do it because of whatever reason but the real question should be yeah you can do it if you fulfill these criteria and sometimes that criteria is not fillable so it's the same as saying no except you're forcing the person to prove their rationale behind that and so it just makes for great dialogue um and, and good communication and it it creates a nice glue between the team and once you have that there's a lot you can accomplish together in IT and in healthcare in general great i think it's a perfect way to end today's interview um thank you raj for um, your time and, and sharing so much uh from your um, experience uh, working as a a surgeon in during wars and um of your experience of you, of your unique ex- experience of building technology and implementing technology in healthcare i think there are many things we all can learn from your experience from you um what well, before we finish what, what is the best way to contact you so people can connect maybe ask questions or maybe partnership opportunities Well, you can go to uh, you can go to LinkedIn and uh you can get my LinkedIn profile there and just uh send me a message. Um and um I'm I'm not too big to receive my own emails, so you can send my email to raj.ambe at ninelinemedical.com. Uh and I will personally Great. respond. Because I think everybody has Great. something to, everybody has something to give. So let me hear it. Yeah. 
all the links will be in the description to this video. Uh, thank you, Raj. Thank, thank you, you, listeners. And we will catch up on next episodes. Thank you, Ivan.